Hello everyone, my name is Frank Wagner and I'm one of the pastors at Holy Spirit Lutheran Church. And it's a joy to be able to be with you and in just a few minutes we're going to start worshiping together. But I've got a couple of important announcements to share with you. Today we are going to be offering drive-in Holy Communion from 11 o'clock until 1 o'clock. Um, I hope that you'll come and join us for that. And if you know of some friends or family members that would benefit from receiving communion, certainly invite them to come as well. You may not know, but we have started our Lenten worship services. We worship together on Wednesdays from 12 noon or at 7 p.m. And if you can't make those times, uh, the services are recorded and they are also on our website. So check that out. And we hope that you can participate in our Lenten services. We have great news for our families. Summer camp is now going to be made available through Camp Lutherock. And our youth from elementary school, middle school, and high school will be going up to North Carolina this summer. Summer camp is not inexpensive. It costs somewhere between $585 and $610 for one camper to attend a week of camp up in the mountains. And so it's always been our commitment that if a youth would like to go to camp, that we're going to make sure that they are able to go. And so we have started a camp scholarship fund. And if you would like to participate in that, there are two key ways you can do that. You can come up to this envelope board here where you'll see there's a lot of envelopes with different dollar amounts on them. Simply go up, take that envelope, and then put that amount of money inside and return the envelope. That's one way. Or you can go to the church website and look up this fundraising event and you'll be able to make a donation that way as well. Also want to let you know that the Holy Week schedule, that is for Palm Sunday through Easter, all of our services have been posted there and you can learn exactly when the service times are going to be. In the same way too, if you have young people that would like to have in Vacation Bible School, Vacation Bible School registration is now available on the church's website too. Something very fun is coming up. We're calling it Spring Fling, and Kara Rucker has been very busy getting things ready so that people who come will have a wonderful time. We are going to have great music. There's even going to be karaoke. So if you love to be able to get in front of your friends and sing a song, have some fun. Karaoke will be available. We're also going to have a food truck here. So it's going to be a fun night of just people getting together in a relaxed, safe way and enjoying each other's company. So come and join us. That is going to be on March 19th. And look up on the website. It'll give you all the information you need to know because you have to register in order to be able to participate. Also want to tell you that the Easter flowers are now available to be ordered. We would ask that you please contact the office or go to the website. You can order flowers in memory of someone, in honor of someone, um, or to the glory of God. If you would like to do that, please order Easter flowers for us. That ends all of the announcements that I have for you. Uh, but Pastor Jim has some very exciting news. He wants to introduce the call committee that will be seeking our next associate pastor. So let's turn things over to Pastor Jim. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God has called us to a new time in our life as Holy Spirit Lutheran Church. It's a time for reflection and prayer, a time for self-examination and seeking, a time for expectation and hope. We are seeking a new associate pastor for our church. The following persons have been appointed to serve as the call committee for our church. Leanne Ballard, Tom Lay, Chris Monty, Annie Noble, Vicki Pugh, George Ternigny, and I too will serve on this team. Dear friends, these persons have been duly appointed to serve as the call committee for this congregation in order to seek an associate pastor. Theirs is a spiritual endeavor on behalf of this congregation. They are to be open to the Spirit's leading and by prayer and holy conversation to undertake this calling to seek an associate pastor for us. They are to be diligent in their seeking, careful in their listening, purposeful in their questioning, and respectful in all that they do. The call committee seeks the Lord's guidance through the Holy Scripture and prayer and deliberations with fellow committee members until they're brought to one mind and one will in Christ and have discerned God's pastor for us. 
Let us pray for those who are being installed today and for our church as we seek the Lord's guidance during this special time. Almighty God, you alone are the great shepherd of the sheep and we turn to you to lead and guide us in all things. Our trust and our hope is in you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Give us a holy patience in this time of our seeking, a patience that trusts in you for our present care, knowing that you will bring our good work to fulfillment in your time. Keep us faithful in mission, regular in worship, responsible in stewardship, mindful of the needy, and diligent in prayer. Bless those who are especially called to serve on the call committee. Give them the gifts they need to seek and find the pastor of your own nurturing, the shepherd of your own choosing, a partner who will broaden our pastoral office, that we might be fed by your holy word and sacraments and grow in faith and love and ministry. All these things we ask, O oh God, with whatever else we need, in the name of him who is the good shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I now declare that this team has been installed as the call committee of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church. May God bring their good work to fulfillment and grace in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim. It's very exciting to have this search process begin. And again, I'd encourage all of you to pray for this process. Now let's begin to worship together.
So hopefully most of you know, if not all of you know, that we are in the middle of a capital campaign called Now More Than Ever. And one of the exciting components of our capital campaign is our brand new digital ministry. Many of you know Eric Rucker as the director of our contemporary uh, worship music ministry, but he also carries tremendous gifts in the area of digital ministry. And so Eric is gonna to talk to us now about that component of our capital campaign. Exactly one year ago, our church temporarily halted in-person worship due to the COVID pandemic. We were forced to pivot immediately to online worship. Until then, Holy Spirit Lutheran Church had maintained an online presence, but we had not tapped into the limitless potential the internet could bring us. While our physical doors were shut, we were able to focus on what our digital ministry would look like. Our church saw the pandemic as an opportunity to build a foundation for a robust online campus to serve our congregation wherever they may be in the world. From the beginning of COVID until now, our website traffic has nearly doubled and the number of people watching our videos has increased 1,350% from the previous year. People from all over the world have spent a combined time of 8,000 hours worshiping together with us. In addition, over 95,000 eyes have seen our presence through the social media platform, Facebook. Three people have even become members of our church after attending our services online. Here are a few words from one of those congregates. Shortly after the shutdown, I started attending virtually. Having the virtual presence of Holy Spirit Lutheran Church during this pandemic has been so centering and affirming for me. It's really helped me in maintaining my connection to God which I and so many others have needed more than ever over the past year. I know that getting to know my church virtually and participating in new member orientation via Zoom is not a story that many have when it comes to finding and joining their church. But for me, the welcoming online environment was a part of why it felt right to make HSLC my church home. I look forward to a time when I'm ready to safely come back in person, but for now, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to watch, learn, and grow in faith online. And that's from Aaron Musk. God has given us a giant opportunity to expand his kingdom. And Aaron's experience is a small part of this story. So what happens next? Because people from all over the world are now able to experience our church, the website has become our new front door. Our plan is to redesign our website from the ground up, creating a true digital second campus with the underpinnings to support an online community that may never step foot in our beautiful campus here in Juno Beach. We are also in the process of developing an app specific to our church to stay in constant communication. This app would be a one-stop shop for everything happening at our church. Through this convenient smartphone app, you will be able to easily see everything that's happening on our campus and interact in a variety of new ways. Our new ministry center will house a new video and audio production center for new classes and other projects. This room will have the proper lighting and technology to bring Christ into the homes of people in creative ways. We also hope to use this space to facilitate hybrid online and in-person classes allowing participants to gather together, no matter where they are. We understand the importance of bringing an online worship service to the homes of our congregation. That's going to continue happening in even more engaging ways. We will continue the creation of online worship experiences for both traditional and contemporary worship services each week. And we only want these experiences to get better and better over time. In this past year, our worship services, classes, and concerts have been experienced 47,000 times by people all over the world. 47,000 times! We want to focus on expanding this even further into the future. In addition to worship services, we will be creating short, digestible content designed to gently remind us and show us Christ's love and teachings throughout the week. 
With your support of this campaign, we can make it easier for you, your family members and friends, and our seasonal guests to benefit from all our ministries year round, no matter where the location. Now that's meeting people where they are. Thank you for your all support. Good morning. The lesson this morning is from Luke chapter 11, verses five through 13. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This ends the reading. Good morning, and please pray with me. God, we give you thanks for this day and ask that we could use part of this day as intentional prayer with you. But we'd ask that you would show us and teach us how to use all of our day as opportunity for conversation with you and that you would teach us what it means to invite you into our lives as we pray more deeply on our own. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing with our sermon series on prayer. We'll conclude next week. Last week, we talked about praying for others. This week, I want to talk about praying for ourselves and by ourselves, the role of prayer in each of our lives. The air conditioning in a Catholic church had broken down, so they had to hire a man to crawl around in the ducts and figure out what was wrong. And as the man peeked down through one of the vents in the sanctuary, he saw his neighbor, an elderly lady, who was kneeling by the altar, apparently saying her rosary. The man just couldn't resist the temptation to mess with the poor lady's mind. In his most authoritative voice, he said, this is Jesus, your prayers will be answered. The little old lady didn't even blink. She just kept on saying her prayers. The man decided that maybe she didn't hear him and tried again. This is Jesus, the son of God, your prayers will be answered. Again, she didn't react at all. Mustering up a big breath of air, the man decided to try one more time. He loudly repeated, This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Your prayers will be answered. And this good Catholic woman looked up and answered, Young man, quiet, please. I'm trying to talk to your mother. Our praying by ourselves, whether kneeling in church or sitting on our back porch, our devotional time spent praying is important. It's an opportunity to be in intimate conversation with God. But that isn't quite the picture Jesus gives us this morning in today's scripture reading. A friend banging on the door at midnight. That's a little less picturesque than devotion time in the backyard garden or in the Gothic chapel. More on that in a minute. There are about 6,800 spoken languages today, and experts believe that at least half will be dead by the end of the century. Nicholas Osler, the president of the Foundation for Endangered Languages, and he is concerned about the large number of rare languages that are now in danger of becoming extinct. He points out that languages die for a number of reasons, war, genocide, disease, low birth rates, government policy, but globalization is probably posing the biggest threat of all. As the global village spreads and various economies become more intertwined, many people who speak minority languages will stop using them. 
For very practical reasons, they will switch to majority languages such as English, Chinese, or Hindi, Urdu. Australia is a good example. English came to this continent through British colonization, just as it came to North America, and it became the language of government and commerce. As a result, 138 of Australia's 261 native languages are now nearly extinct. Yet, understandably, neither Osler nor other experts point to another language that may be in danger of extension, the language of prayer. Perhaps it's not true. Who would admit that they don't pray or believe in prayer? In fact, according to a George Barna survey in 2017, 79% of adults said they pray at least once in the last three months. Yet, praying once every three months hardly seems like a strong endorsement of the power of prayer. If we really believed that God answers prayer and that prayer unleashes the power of God, would we pray just once a quarter? Perhaps it's a case of people just mouthing the words, racing through the prayer of Jabez or prayer of Jesus, thus relegating prayer to a minority language used by fewer and fewer people, leaving it with a cloudy and uncertain future. Have we allowed the dominant languages of government and commerce to take over our lives, edging out the lesser known speech patterns that can connect us in a life-giving way to God? Have we pushed the language of prayer to the verge of extension, making it a tongue that has just a handful of speakers, most of them elderly? Just like languages, prayer has vocabulary and grammar or word agreements. I want to consider two vocabulary words Jesus gives us for our prayer life. They are words of relationship. His parable first talks about friends and then talks about a father. Several places in scripture mention likening God to a friend. Exodus says that God spoke to Moses as a friend. Second Chronicles 20 refers to Abraham as God's friend. And maybe that's a place to begin. Long before Jesus addressed God as Abba, father, the Israelites knew him intimately as a friend. And I try not to use that word lightly here. Many of us would say that we have lots of friends. In my way of thinking, we have lots of acquaintances, people that we know. That doesn't mean that they are our friends. I place too high a demand on friendship. A friend responds when all others have scattered. A friend accepts us where we are, but never lets us remain there. She challenges us when she thinks we're wrong. He loves us when he knows we are hurt. He or she helps us grow and become a better person. And ultimately, at the root of it all, is a trust that can risk anything said or done. Hawaiians have many terms for friend that signify varying degrees and types of friendship. Haloala, beloved companion, for example, is a general term for friend. Makamaka, though, means face to face a friend with whom you share freely. And here's a great one, akoi, literally meaning ax handle. It's a trusted friend. You don't swing the ax if you know the head is going to go flying off and injure someone or something. Akoi is that friend that will survive the toughest questions and most difficult situations lobbed at us. And I think it's that akoi ax handle relationship that Abraham shares with God. We talked two weeks ago about Abraham bargaining with God. He knows that God will endure his bargaining. Abraham trusted God enough that he knew he could blurt out those socially unacceptable things to him. He knew that he could pester God and God would not strike him dead. And I think this trust was rooted in God's declaration that Abraham was righteous. A few chapters before this scene of Abraham and God haggling, God forges the covenant with Abraham, that Abraham would be the father of a great nation. Chapter 15 says, Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. 
This peace from Genesis becomes the root of Paul's argument in both Romans and Galatians that we are saved by faith in God's promises. We're not saved by our works in keeping the law. Abraham was so certain of the promises of God. Abraham believed so completely in God. Abraham was so assured of the status God pronounced on him as righteous that he didn't fear that being taken away from him just because he asked God a few questions. Lots of Christians know who God is. Lots of Christians are acquainted with God. But how many of us are axe handle Christians, so utterly trusting in God that we know our status as his children is permanent and that we can ask for whatever we need, like that friend in the parable? A few years ago, theologian and author Barbara Brown Taylor wrote in an article in Christianity Today, there's nothing wrong with letting God know what we want as long as we do not mistake our list for the covenant. The covenant has no conditions. The covenant is no deal. It is God's promise to be our God, which contains within it the promise that we shall be God's people, not by our consent, but by our creation. Entering into prayer is not so much about getting God to give us what we want. It seems to be more about God turning us into the people God wants. Which brings me to one of my favorite images for our individual prayer life. A 17th century rabbi, Leona Medina, explained prayer this way. If you watch a man out on a boat grab a rope and pull his boat to the shore, you might think, if you were confused about weight and motion, that he was really pulling the shore to his boat. People have much the same confusion about spiritual weight and motion. In prayer, some believe that you are pulling God closer to you, but in fact, the heartfelt prayer pulls you closer to God. Perhaps that is why one could argue that the language of prayer is at risk of becoming extinct. We try to turn prayer into something about us. We try to make God some cosmic Santa Claus we can present our wish list to. We misinterpret knocking and asking and seeking to be all about us. No matter how strong our faith, we can't pull the shore closer to us. Our pulling moves us closer to where God is, which I think begs the question of where is God? That's a sermon series on its own, but a couple of answers I'd offer here are that God is with the poor. Have you found your boat moving closer there? God is with outsiders, not insiders. Who's tied up next to you at the dock? God is with the powerless, not the powerful. How does that affect your serving, your voting, your spending? God is with the suffering and the hurting. Have you entered more challenging waters, if that's the case? C.S. Lewis writes of prayer, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. With that asking and knocking and searching, are we ready to ask for God to change us? Ready to knock on doors that will open and expose us to change? In our searching, Are we ready to be found? A pastor phoned the home of some recent church visitors. A voice answered with a whispered, hello. The pastor asked, who is this? Jimmy. How old are you, Jimmy? Four. The pastor continued, Jimmy, may I speak to your mom? Jimmy said, she's busy. Then may I speak to your dad? He's busy. 
The pastor follows up, are there any other adults at your home? The police. The pastor said, then let me speak to one of the police officers. They're busy. The pastor asked, who else is there? Little Jimmy said, firemen. The pastor said, well, put one of the firemen on the phone. They're busy. Jimmy, what are they all busy doing? And the whisper came back, they're looking for me. Just like Jimmy, a lot of people are hiding, not from parents and police, but from God. And there's nothing funny about hiding from the one who loves us most and the one we need the most. We find all kinds of ways to hide. We hide out of pride, wanting to prove to God and others that we can do it for ourselves. We hide out of shame, afraid that God and others will reject us, unable to love us in the messes in which we find ourselves. But Jesus has good news for us. At the end of the parable, Jesus revisits the vocabulary of God as our Father. The implication being that we who are parents know how to give good things to our children. We know how to be gracious. If we, who are broken and sinful, are capable of doing this, can you not imagine how much easier and natural it is for God to do the same with us? It's God's nature to give us good things, to deal graciously with us. At the heart of God is mercy and grace and goodness. The new things that come with our asking and seeking and searching and knocking are good things, gracious things, merciful things. Moving to the shoreline where God is found is nothing to hide from and everything to find. That's the grammar and word agreement part of this language of prayer. We don't put words together for our will to be done. It's about thy will be done. Our language aligns and pulls us closer to where God is and what God wants for us. Theologian Karl Barth said, to clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. Language that moves us toward God is contrary to the order of this world that tries to draw everything to us. Placing God at the center is riotous action in a world that wants us to place ourselves at the center. When you pray, when you ask and seek and knock for something different, something better, you're at the beginning of an uprising. Turning ourselves and others, for that matter, into what God wants. Well, expect some resistance. To do that, you're going to need an akoi, an axe handle kind of trusted friend. Because you'll be pounding on that door and asking and searching at hours beside midnight. And perhaps, just maybe, the one whom you are looking for is actually looking for you. Amen. Let us prepare now our hearts and minds to receive Holy Communion. And I want to remind each one of you that we will be offering drive-in Holy Communion uh, following our services today from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto each and every one of you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said to them, Take and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. 
He then gave it to his disciples and said to them, Drink of it, all of you. For this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. I invite you now to join with me as together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table of the Lord is ready. Let us join together for our closing prayer. Father God, we thank you for inviting us and encouraging us to come to you in prayer. You understand that our lives can be overwhelming and scary. We find our hope and comfort in coming to you. Thank you that your arms are always open wide to us, that you are always attentive to each of our prayers, and that you always respond by doing what is best for us and for your kingdom. Father, we pray for our call committee. We thank you that these seven people have stepped forward to assume the responsibility for the benefit of our congregation to begin the process now of seeking that individual who will come to join us in ministry as our associate pastor. Lord, we pray for that individual who does not yet know that he or she is going to be uh, approached by us, invited by us to join us in ministry. I pray, Lord, that you will prepare their hearts, prepare their minds to be receptive to your will in their life. Lord, I pray for our congregation that we will be in regular prayer to you, that we will ask for your help and guidance through your Holy Spirit to guide our call committee, to guide our church council, to identify that individual that you know will be best for us as a church. Lord, we pray for our new capital campaign called Now More Than Ever. I pray that you will guide us, guide each one of us to respond to this campaign as you know would be best for us, as each one of us is capable of doing. Help each one of us to feel a part of this exciting step forward as we bless this congregation so that it can be a blessing to our community and world. And that we will be able to be a blessing also to young children who find themselves in crisis situations in their homes. And that they will be able to have a safe place to go to until matters at home are settled. We pray for those who are sick and in recovery. Especially we lift up to you Steve Thorne, Beverly Coburn, Carol Hagee, and Pastor Ron Qualley as well as all the other names that we lift up to you now in prayer individually. We ask, Lord, for your healing power to be with each one of them. We ask that you will guide the medical community to diagnose appropriately and to put together a plan that will lead to comfort and healing for each of these persons. And then, Lord, we pray for all leaders as our nation now is beginning to be more relaxed because of the COVID crisis seemingly heading in a uh, less critical direction, leaders are having to decide what is now the safe way to gather. So we know that leaders in schools, leaders in businesses, leaders in churches, and leaders in our government are all trying to decide what is safe, what is appropriate, how can we continue to gather in ways that will be helpful to people? Lord, we pray for your wisdom to prevail in our decision making. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive now the benediction. As you go your way, may God go with you. May God go before you to show you his way, 
behind you to encourage you along that way, above you to watch over you and care for you, and beside you to be your very best friend. And may God always go within you to give you his peace and his joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.